My name is Bobby John, and it's my pleasure to invite you to this afternoon session where we focus our attention on um, kidney diseases and people who are living with it. And it's not just the people who live with it, it's also the families of people who live with kidney disease because while it's an individual issue, uh, when it comes to managing it, it's more than just the person, it is the family and the community around too, which includes the people who provide you the expert advice, the care in the form of nephrologists, in the form of all the other people who form part of that team and enable you to both cope with a deteriorating kidney function and enable you to then live a life as normal as possible. Thank you so much for joining us. This is one more of our series of presentations, webinars, virtual conferences, as you may like to call it, um, brought to you by the IHW Council. We started off earlier on with a wide-ranging conversation around where the health systems need to go and preparedness around the coronavirus pandemic. We've looked at specific issues around how do we provide care for those with cancer. We had a brilliant session where nearly 15,000 of you logged in on issues around mental health. And I hope today's edition where we speak about uh, people living with kidney disease will be able to understand a perspective of how they need to both safeguard themselves and obtain the best level of care at a time when the entire health system is under great stress. We have a great panel joining us. These are the CNM, among the CNMOS people, those who shape both the state of practice and also um, are able to guide us in how we need to approach our particular clinical situations or our care situations during times when everything is kind of going or I. In no particular order, I just want to kind of start with the introductions. Um, as I see the people on the screen, I will just introduce them um, to my left top corner, and I'm not sure how the Facebook audience is uh, seeing them, but to my left and top, I have uh, Dr. Shankar Ray, Deepak Shankar Ray. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We have to my right top corner, uh, Dr. Almeida from Bombay. Thank you so much, sir, for joining in. Uh, at the bottom left corner, I have um, Dr. Agarwal from the Orlando Institute of Medical Sciences. Also from the Orlando Institute of Medical Sciences, we have uh, Dr. Guleria. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. And uh, Dr. Georgi Abraham, thank you so much for joining us from Chennai. So we have pretty much a, a, a distribution. We have the, the uh, Delhi side, we have Bombay, we have the South side. And I'm hoping that we are able to have a meaningful conversation among all of us. Just to set this stage, why do we want to particularly have a focus session on kidney disease, kidney care um, during this particular time? I know that we are coming up to three weeks of a lockdown situation in this country. Um, we have just passed 100 days of uh, knowing that we India has a coronavirus um, outbreak. What is it that this situation means for us. And may I start with uh, Dr. Almeida? I mean, um, if I may kind of ask you to um, set the ball rolling and then I'll kind of move on um, and then ask each one of you um, for your introductory remarks. Why, why do we need to care about kidney disease at this particular point in time? Well, as I see it, the COVID-19 has created issues for the kidney disease patients, as well as patients who are on treatments for their kidney disease. And when we look at these various aspects in detail, we find out what type of problems could exist for these patients. In the past few days, I have been fielding questions from my patients wherein they have been asking me, how, what is the risk for me from this COVID-19? pandemic and what should I do in addition which will prevent me from being a victim of this uh, pandemic. The other thing is many of the patients of chronic kidney disease are on treatments which may predispose them to a more severe form of the infection and this causes a lot of stress and as I heard you, you also indicated that there has been such a discussion wherein there have been questions posed to mental health experts as to what has 
is the mental stress which these patients undergo. Even patients who are in a dialysis uh, unit undergoing dialysis look at things differently. They feel chained to the machine, looking at people around them and being defenseless. So these are all issues which come up when we're looking at the chronic kidney disease patients varying from stage uh, up to stage five into dialysis and even maybe beyond after transplantation. Thank you. May I turn to Professor Agrawal? Um, yes, uh, the word risk has been surfaced right in the opening comments itself. What is the, the risk to people with underlying kidney disease in these particular moments um, and at a broad level, and then we can kind of get into these specific discussions, but at a broad level, what is it that you see as a risk? The uh, patient of chronic kidney disease, uh, whether with on dialysis or can get it for transplant are at a higher risk because these patients are immunocompromised. So not only that infection risk of uh, coronavirus is more, but if they develop infection, the severity of the disease is also more. Second thing is that these patients are one of the chronic diseases where treatment required is on a regular basis. So many of the transplant medicine, they find difficulty in getting availability in their area. Because of the lockdown, they have to be restricted in their own area. So these medicine needs to be available in those area. Plus, if they are on a dialysis, then they are exposed to the hospital environment because sure. they have to come to the hemodialysis three times in a week to the hospital setting, which current situation are a place where the risk of infection is high. Thank you, sir. Because so of you... these peculiarity, they have got uh, certain at a disadvantage of uh, risk because of the infection. Thank you so much, sir. Um, the word that you used, immunocompromised, meaning that people with chronic kidney disease or people who are undergoing dialysis, their defenses are lesser than those without the uh, chronic kidney disease condition or with those who don't have to undergo periodic dialysis. So therefore, they are more vulnerable, if I may kind of use that word, um, to contracting a, a, an infection. And with a particularly transmissible condition like coronavirus, um, they are at a very high risk. How does a, a patient with underlying kidney disease or somebody who needs to undergo regular dialysis, how does one minimize this risk that both Dr. Almeida and Dr. Agarwal have uh, mentioned? How does, they, how, how does one go about minimizing that risk? May I ask uh, Dr. Deepak Ray? Yeah, <clears throat> one is, uh, see patients who are on dialysis, especially they have to go to hospital two to three times a day. They should not go for an emergency dialysis. They should be avoiding an emergency situation. Suddenly they have to go to the hospital at night. Uh, the transport is difficult. The dialysis may not be available. So these are two ways of doing this. One, they have to they have to continue their dialysis in a very uh, regular manner. They should not drop any dialysis uh, appointment. And second, they should take food which will not go for emergency dialysis. They won't be going for emergency dialysis. Like if you take more of water than prescribed, if you take more of salt than advised, if you take foods which contains more of potassium, you can have emergencies. You can have a respiratory problem, chest problem. You can have a heart problem. And you may have to land in the hospital in emergency. In this situation of pandemic uh, time, it is better, always better to avoid as far as possible the emergencies. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Um, essentially, the advice that's coming is keep to your regular schedule, avoid getting into a situation where you need to go to the hospital for your dialysis out of turn or in an emergency situation. And for that, there are things that you need to do at the home end, which is ensuring that your intake either of salts or of fluids are of such a quantity and um, timing that you do not have to come into a situation where you need an out of turn or an emergency intervention. Dr. Abraham, um, if I may turn to you, um, 
people will need to go to the hospitals. Is there a way that this can be, uh, let's put it this way, minimized? I'm not, I know that that's uh, asking a very hard question for on behalf of people who are anyway stressed. Um, is there anything that can be done for them? Yeah, at the um, moment? Mr. Baby John and my distinguished colleagues, it's a great privilege to address the audience who are listening to us. Um, let me just tell that there are two types of stakeholders in this. One is the healthcare professional, which includes the doctors, the nurses, the dietitians, the housekeeping people who are taking care of dialysis patients who come to the dialysis centers, and the next are the patients. In our country, you know, most of the dialysis patients are dialyzed in a hospital situation. So they are under tremendous, uh, because of the media, under tremendous emotional stress and physical stress, and which may show up in various forms. So basically what we have to look at is that, uh, who are these patients? We have patients on dialysis who differ gender-wise, males and females, and also age-wise, we have uh, young stage, middle age, and old age people who are on dialysis, and we have different comorbidities like diabetes, because Sanjay Agarwal will tell you that um, majority of the chronic kidney disease patients in India are type two diabetics. And also we do have a large proportion of hypertensive patients in our country, nearly 220 million people and 72 million diabetics. Now, when you look at the risk of a chronic kidney disease patient, reading through the literature, I understand that there's a threefold increase in contracting or in getting infected with COVID in chronic kidney disease patients. And this may increase substantially when you have patients with diabetes, whose diabetes is not well controlled, and then those who have heart failure and hypertension and other comorbid conditions. Malnutrition is widely prevalent in our country in both chronic kidney disease patients, not on dialysis and on dialysis. And this may also have an impact on the immune system of the patient. So the best way I see is that, uh, because I just uh, got a, every week we get an update from UK, from the Royal College of Physicians president. There are 20,000 patients on hemodialysis in UK and 926 of them got infected with COVID and the rate was about 15% in dub. So this is the one of the best data which we got from a developed country. Then I was looking at the peritoneal dialysis patient because we have a large contingent of peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis patients. The peritoneal dialysis patients are home dialysis patients. They stay at home. So their chance of contracting COVID-19 is much less compared to hemodialysis. I spoke to people in uh, South Korea because they were in the forefront, spoke to people in Hong Kong, and also spoke to people in North America who are our colleagues and in United Kingdom and Canada. And uh, they say that they haven't got much data on home peritoneal dialysis patients getting COVID infection. In short, I just want to, to reinforce that Home dialysis patients have a better chance of remaining COVID-19 in infection free compared to hemodialysis patients who are coming to a center. So how do we help them? Because we need to educate our patients. Because I have two sorts of dialysis, hemodialysis. One is a hospital-based hemodialysis patient who are from middle class. And we run a charity called Tanger Foundation across Tamil Nadu, where we take care of about 570 so I'll come back to you. I'll come right. back to you because yes. um, thank you for pointing out that the level of risk, while we kind of defined risk and we kind of looked at where people can yes. get into trouble, um, you have kind of, uh, with your numbers, um, essentially pointed out that if you are already on a dialysis kind of a routine and you happen to be contracting uh, the COVID infection, then the probabilities of uh, bad outcomes are substantially higher. If I were to ask you, Dr. Valeria, to sum up in terms of, so in people are aware that they are at risk, there may be great stress, they still cannot avoid going to the hospital, they are in a position where everybody is going to talk around them and tell them, look, something is going to happen to you. What is it that as the good doctor, you would tell people saying, this is what you shouldn't do, this is what you should do. And I'm going to ask you to summarize because I then want to take it to the Facebook audience too. See, I think as it's already been said, and uh, 
essentially the whole issue is that you've got to follow the same principles that apply to the general public which means you've only got to visit a hospital if it's absolutely necessary you've got to wash your hands you've got to make sure you wear a mask and you make sure that you interact and keep social dis- distancing as much as possible so minimize your social interactions but i look after a group of people who've had a transplant and i think for that group of people who've had a transplant this uh, covid-19 is something that we don't at the moment have sufficient data to come to any conclusions as to what they should do and what they shouldn't do but we do know that the immunosuppressed will have a higher risk of having infections so i do think it's for them it's important only to visit a hospital if it's necessary at the apollo hospital where i work we've now started a tele uh, a tele uh, opd so we have our all our consults if not necessary can be on the opd uh, can be on a tele conference but of course if you do have a problem you will have to come to a hospital and it's common for us to have patients with fever who will need to be tested for covid to make sure they're covid negative so at the moment like georgie said stay at home if, uh, if if you can you must visit a hospital if you have to and keep your dialysis appointments as they are don't don't come in the emergency so to kind of um cap it's about 15 minutes into the conversation and this is something that i'll have to do every 15 minutes because our audience also kind of keeps waxing and waning so just to kind of uh, turn my eyes away from you to the rest of the population uh, uh, our audience take care do not be overly anxious the same precautions that others in your family or in your home in your neighborhood take are good enough for you you have a few more caveats to work with just make sure that your regular schedules for your dialysis are being followed do not put yourself in a position either because of excess fluid or salt intake or whatever else the dietary restrictions that you are on by breaking that or by overstepping that that you put yourself into a position where you need to come into a hospital having said that if you have a fever if you are at a position where you are feeling that you are unwell please do seek care as early as possible do not delay that because the course of any un uh, detected condition for you may be particularly different from what would be with people those who don't have underlying kidney disease so therefore i want to kind of uh, reassure you that you have let's put it this way the same set of precautions to take as the regular set of people i know that earlier on um one underlying condition was mentioned and i want to start with that because that seems to be the start point for many people to end up with chronic kidney disease which is diabetes there is a large population of people with diabetes a significant proportion of them do progress into kidney disease for those diabetics and with kidney disease is there something that we need to be paying attention to i i start with professor agarwal here um so for that set of people in addition to whatever they are doing for their kidney disease specific intervention what is it that covid poses for their diabetes situation he is uh, during this period they uh, their diabetes has to be very well controlled because if it is uncontrolled diabetes they might have complication and land up uh, into hospital uh, in a emergency situation which may not be a good idea in current situation in a short term uh, whether it is very good control of diabetes probably is unlike to uh, unlikely to have any significant effect in terms of a progression of kidney disease because of diabetes so is more of a very good control is required during this period so that they don't land up into emergency unnecessary uh, which means dr almeda in addition to being taken care of by their nephrologist or nephrology team they need to be in touch with their uh, with the person who is providing overall con- uh, directions for their diabetes care is stress also going to be a factor in the lives of those with underlying diabetes so you're on mute yeah we have been told repeatedly that the patient who is a diabetic a hypertensive is at a graver risk with this infection so if we are looking at this scenario we need to allay the stress of the patient 
ensuring that his diabetes is well controlled, as Dr. Garwal has already mentioned. There are certain medications which may be required to be removed from the diabetic regime, which may uh, complicate issues in the patient who is decompensated. So uh, this, along with dietary modifications, one thing which was mentioned was the lockdown. Now, in the lockdown, besides medicines not being available, the prescribed diet too may not be available. And then patients are at uh, their wit's end as to what to include in their diet. So all these uh, work towards a stress situation in the patient. Um, thank you so much. Sir. And I will come back to this diet issue with all of you because that's something that confronts people, especially during times when um, the regular set of suppliers or supplies are Going to be constrained. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Almeida mentioned hypertension too. In addition to the diabetes part of it, there is a significant proportion of people who may have started off with hypertension coming this way or have got hypertension that is uh, concurrently running. The management of that or what is it that they need to be attentive to? Well, <clears throat> hypertension, as we know, is very common with the kidney diseases. Whether he has had a transplant, or if it is pre-transplant also. Certain transplant medicine do cause uh, increase in blood pressure medicine. So they must have been prescribed antihypertensives for that. They have to continue the antihypertensive and do not drop the drugs. For, for a transplant patients, besides immunosuppressive, other medicines like they are more prone to diabetes, they are more prone to hypertension, they are more prone to heart disease. So all these medicines has to be in stock at least for a month or two and they should be take, uh, regularly taking the medicines. And for dialysis patient, it is easier because two or three times a week they are coming to the hospital. Somebody can, we, and we will measure their uh, blood pressure in the dialysis unit, and we can readjust the drugs. For others, if their blood pressure is, most of them uh, monitor the blood pressure at home. If the blood pressure is fine, they should continue the medicine. If there is a problem, if it is rising, they can talk to the doctor concerned. Right. So if you're on dialysis, you have the ability of being followed up uh, regularly. You have that opportunity because you will be checked. But if you're not, if, if you're somebody who's got longer, uh, if you've got a once a week schedule or something like that, then you need to be making sure that your supply of drugs, uh, both for whether uh, for hype or for diabetes, needs to be there. You could not run out of stock at home. If, if that be the case, um, uh, May I take to uh, Dr. Galeria? There's a question already here uh, from one of the audience. Um, Facebook user Arpita Mukhopadhyay is asking, sorry, um, your num yeah. names are there and it's available particularly um, for all to see. So therefore the privacy issue is um, not there. But the question that comes along is this. Um, for people who are awaiting transplants, can they go ahead? or is it the position where they need to hold back? Where is it that um, you are in on that situation? You know, this is, it's a very, very good question. And it's a very difficult question to answer. However, I think it's important for all of us to understand that COVID-19 is here to stay. It's not going to go away. It's not that after two days or after a month, it's going to go away. So we have to learn to live with COVID till a vaccine comes, uh, comes along. As we've learned to live with H1N1, as we've learned to live with SARS or MERS. The issue is how do we minimize the risks in our transplant population so that they can go ahead and have a safe transplant. Having said this, I th at the current moment, there are guidelines available which you should follow. And I think some guidelines you should not follow. But at the current moment, I think if you have a donor and a recipient and they're not doing well on dialysis or they're keen to proceed for a transplant, you could actually proceed provided your hospital, you don't you know, burden your hospital's ICU or you, you know, it's not endemic for COVID, it's swamped with COVID patients, you should hang on. But if it is not, and you have less than 10% of your patients and your ICU is separate, your patients are separate, you could go ahead. Test the donor CBC, look for a COVID-19 swab on him, and of course, do a CT scan on both the donor and the recipient. Take a good epidemiological history to make sure they haven't come from a country where, or they come in contact with somebody who has COVID. 
But I have lost a patient waiting for a transplant during the COVID epidemic. And I can tell you it's traumatic. And you must always weigh the benefits versus the risks. And I think COVID is here to stay. We'll have to work around it. We'll have to get over it. Postponing may look very easy, but you're not helping people you're supposed to help. Dr. Elias, thank you so much for understanding one thing, that if people, all of us included, think that magically on such and such a date, COVID will disappear, um, we are living in a different um, world of imagination. To repeat your word, this is here to stay, and this is going to be an added feature into our already crowded um, clinical spectrum. And so therefore, when people come with any disease, this is one of the things that the care providing institution, care providers, uh, and uh, the clinical uh, team leaders will have to factor in right through. And so therefore, to avoid situations like the tragic one that Dr. Hilarius just now mentioned about losing someone who was already waiting for a transplant simply because you wanted to extend the timeline, um, that will have to work around. And that's something that uh, the healthcare institutions and the teams that work around us and the families and including the uh, public health uh, authorities in the country will have to essentially grapple with and enable life to move on. Otherwise, we have um, going, we will end up with multiple um, such instances which are not happy endings at all. If we were to kind of look at then those that are waiting for a transplant situation, um, just if I may ask, um, what's the kind of waiting list? What's the numbers that we are talking about in this country? I mean, who, who do I ask? A anybody, please, if you just show me your hand. All sure. of you. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Okay. Ray. Okay. Um, the waiting number varies, varies in the sense from, from region to region. Uh, like in East, we do a lot of live uh, donor uh, transplantations. And uh, we, at present, suppose we as a hospital, we do around 50 transplants in a month. We'll have around 150 waiting list uh, for last two months. We have not been doing transplant. That is because the all infrastructure, everything has been directed towards uh, Corona or COVID. Uh, but that will be the waiting list here. And in a national, wise, national level, it will be much higher. I think Dr. So Guleria will be in a better position to tell about this. So at your end, what where you were doing, say, 50, say, per month, now with a halt, you all of these individuals are right now currently in, in a waiting mode, waiting for the day that things will get back to full operation. So we can uh, essentially do that, yes. that, that you can go ahead and do that. Uh, Dr. Almeida from Bombay, I mean, what, what's your um, sense of, in your institution? Well, in, in our institution too, we have kept, all patients on hold. We have not had a last transplant, which was done in early March. And shortly after that, we had a good cadaver donor. Good means the, we are a donor who fulfills the standard criteria for do, uh, disease donation. And we could not use it because this was right in the middle of the time when COVID was showing it, rearing its ugly head. And we had a patient who was awaiting a cadaver donut transplant. But after discussing with the family, the, both the donor and her husband, we found, we indicated what was the risk to both. Because Sandeep has mentioned about the losing a, a transplant recipient or potential transplant recipient in, during the waiting period. There's also an ad, added risk, which I should make known. He did mention that we should be having a swab to rule out that the donor or the recipient does not have the COVID infection because you're also predisposing the operating team and the caregivers to a COVID infection. So this is something else which needs to be looked into when you jump in. If you have a live related donor, definitely you can uh, push the date um, further down the road. This is donors especially those with standard criteria for a disease donation, a few to come by. Right. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, I mean, what's the volume that you have now kept um, on hold um, in terms of uh, the people 
on your transplant um, list? See, uh, we in our hospital has got approximately 150 patients waiting for the transplant. But this uh, transplant in current scenario uh, needs to be interpreted in from a much different angles also. It's not only the medical fitness of the patient, recipient and the donor in living related transplant, which is important, but we should also think that in a post-transplant, immediate post-transplant period, when the drugs are on a higher side, they are at a risk of an infection, which is much more common in Indian setup. So if we, if, I mean, one angle we can see that obviously uh, COVID is going to stay, but still we have locked down completely. The reason is because we don't know how it is going to evolve in immediate future. So once it is uncertainty in an immediate future, then how it is going to evolve, that is why there is a restriction. Uh, with the passage of time, once we know that what is the situation in the community, how much percentage of the patient are asymptomatic patient are likely to remain in the system, then we will be in a better position to interpret that a patient who is operated for transplant, what is his probability of getting infection in a normal circumstance. I am sure right. this restriction of transplant is for the time being, once the disease is still evolving as far as our country is concerned. With time, these situations are going to change and I am sure lockdown will, will be removed the OPD will be started, the regular elective surgery will be started. So we'll be in a better position to interpret uh, that what is we are expected to hope with in future. Professor Abraham, um, from Chennai, what's your sense? I mean, what is it that uh, you're backed up on? And uh, um, just responding to Professor Agarwal, the way he kind of uh, said, we just hold on a little bit more as compared to what uh, Dr. Guleria was saying, um, we need to kind of address the situation that we have it and work along. Um, thank you, Bobby, for that question, because we are locked down and Tamil Nadu government has told us that no regular outpatients and only emergency surgeries and emergency admission to the hospital. And uh, as a result of that, you know, we are waiting for the guidelines today. Are we allowed to conduct our regular OPs so we are holding on our, to our transfer. But I just want to make a note of caution to all my uh, audience as well. See, there is a test called IgM and IgG antibody. I think that there could be a number of healthcare workers who were infected and who will be infected in future. So anybody who is taking care of the transplant patients, transplant recipients should have a test done for IgM and IgG antibody to know that way, whether they have already had an infection or whether they are an asymptomatic carrier. Because this is very important because in the operation theater and following the transplant, these patients are going to be heavily immunosuppressed. So we are getting that kit shortly. The kit hasn't arrived. So our hospital policy is to have an IgM test done and an um, antibody measured and see that whether it is present or not which will only take about half an hour and it is a cost effective thing. So we are holding our transplant at this point in time, both the Cisona transplant as well as because of the directions from the government of Tamil Nadu. Now I just want to roll back onto something about diabetes. So we are talking about a well-controlled diabetic. So it is possible that a lot of our patients at various stages of chronic kidney disease may overtreat their diabetes. A hypoglycemia is a killing situation compared to hyperglycemia. So people have to be extremely careful in managing their diabetic by themselves because we all talk about control your diabetes and they may by inadvertently take medications such as oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin, which can land them in severe hypoglycemia. This also has to be addressed. So any diabetic patient should contact their nephrologist or their diabetologist before they either escalate or de-escalate their medications to prevent the development of a hypoglycemia of blood sugar less than 65 milligram per deciliter. Right, thank you so much. Um, I, I can come up, uh, Professor Agawal, you have your hand up. Um, let me take your question before I come back to Dr. Guleria who kind of 
has has essentially underscored that covid is here to stay we need to figure out a way to go dr agarwal okay in in terms of antibody testing uh we still do not know because these patient are immunocompromised patient and they they may not respond to the antibody test by formation yeah, of okay. antibody so sure. we Let, need we come back to, to that assess... we, i will come back to that because i it, it is okay. a it is a point for conversation and we need to have that and i'll come back from valeria i mean you've heard uh, from northeast west south i mean in terms of the fact that yes all transplants are on hold you started off and that's why i kind of went right around the country you said this is a situation that we have to deal with and 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 figure out a way we can't put lives on hold we have to kind of move on and so so therefore how do you kind of uh, respond see the issue is uh, the the issue is that there is a fair amount of data available now from all over the world you have more than a you have so many cases from all over the world right Korea at the height of its epidemic never stopped its transplant program right Japan today still does its live donor renal transplants though they have a state emergency going on and there are guidelines even in the United States where they say you, you know we are not swamped by a respiratory epidemic in India at the moment i know no hospital that is like new york or like london you know we are still at the beginning or, or are we over it nobody knows right these are good times you know if things are going to get bad now get the good ones out and if they're going to get bad we'll stop then but at the moment we haven't seen the side the type of covid that the usa the uk or spain or italy have seen you know and why we only had less we were 300 odd deaths look at the west right so obviously we are we seeing a different disease is is our lockdown working what's happening nobody seems to know you know are you guys so i i think you know and two weeks or three weeks or four weeks are not going to change we've just got to know that covid is going to be around people will start tra- traveling all over again you will see people with covid in your opd you will have to wear a mask you'll have to practice social distancing you will have to take precautions but it's and you will have the odd patient who will turn out to be covid positive you see right. h1n1 all the time now so it's sure. you know it's we've got to we've got to get over it it's it's, it's a new disease added to transplant infectious diseases and we have to learn and learn and and we've got to add to the learning by our experience thank you so much um, at this moment i just want to kind of and i'll come back to dr ray i mean you I, i saw your hand go up um, in a second Let, because it's a, it's a 15 minute thing and, and i just need to kind of ensure that the audience kind of uh, gets a, a a capsule back in first and foremost and i want to reiterate what professor george abraham just now said the risk of you taking on your own diabetes management in your hands is quite high and so therefore be aware that you do not escalate your dosing or change your medication on your own just because you were not able to get to the hospital or you were um, unable to kind of reach your care provider you should not come into a situation where you are running the risk of hypoglycemia that would be potentially very difficult for you and so therefore be be very mindful i would i would suspect that the same applies for your antihypertensive medications and everything else also that you are prescribed ensure that you have the ability to reach your care provider your physician at least by phone or whatsapp do not make those titration decisions on your own because that adds to any kind of a risk proposition that you have and so with that the last bit that we heard and i kind of want to kind of continue this conversation with covid is here to stay it's it's one more of those risks that we have to manage and so therefore is it time that we basically said we have to up our game in both the screening that we do with our potential um, transplant patients or with, res- with respect to every patient and care provider who is in our ecosystem and then act appropriately so if 20 years ago with hiv we said universal precautions is it time to escalate the di- definition of universal precaution and and move forward with life dr ray let me start with you yeah <clears throat> there are uh, three issues when we do a transplant actually i saw a recent paper in anigem from uh, one they have done transplant during the covid period and 15% of their recipient they did the donor and recipient check viral check before transplant 15% of their recipient 
developed by covid viremia so the transplant in certain situations are emergency occasionally in kidney but not mostly in kidney but in liver situation it can be emergency so you have to go ahead with the transplant the present problem is the post transplant we have to give significantly higher dose of immunosuppression they are very highly immunosuppressed so initial month or so uh, they are more prone to infection the second every hospital has is full with Uh, you know the patients etc and their infrastructure is stressed now we have to divert lot of manpower for the covid uh, and lot of uh, place for the covid so it becomes difficult to do a transplant because we have to redirect some of this manpower here which is which is a technical difficulty the best way to go about it since india is a big country the places where there is high covid so called hot spots maybe bombay maybe delhi maybe calcutta you may not do the transplant where the covid is not there you can start doing transplant and see how it goes so we i do agree we cannot hold back the transplant for a long time our people are suffering it's not only the uh, health wise suffering it is economically they are suffering they are on dialysis uh, uh, this is a difficult lockdown period they have to come to the hospital a transplant will give a better life but probably the midway is the places where there is high covid and the there are lot of stress on the infrastructure healthcare workers they should wait for that or in liver transplant cardiac transplant when there is an emergency one should go ahead and do the transplant may turn to dr almeida um is it time that the the notion of infection control does not just get restricted to the transplant unit or or uh, it it's its surroundings but now begins to ex- uh, encompass the entire healthcare institution in such a way that um we are, we do not put our regular work on hold is this a time a, a point where hospitals health infrastructure health care workers and the whole uh, professions uh, essentially take a stock and basically say we have to jump uh, another level altogether of figuring out infection control at least in mumbai this doesn't seem to be in the near future because we are battling with a lot of load of patients and the uh, healthcare services are stretched thin you have a lot of hospitals which have been closed down because of the healthcare personnel who have been uh, uh, laid low by this infection you have a lot of dialysis units closing down uh now as far as once of course these numbers start coming under control and we have some semblance of control then we can really uh get into a not different frame of mind and we'll be thinking of doing things differently the other thing is even in this lockdown period you will see that s- some uh, degree of the the uh, as not really permeated all levels of society so actually you'd addressed the a way we manage infections in a healthcare setting i would even go one step be, behind and say that we should even have education of how patients or people the common person on the street looks to do things differently maybe even when you have a, the coughing etiquette or the sneezing etiquette or the spitting etiquette whatever you you have these need to be also uh, looked into in fact we should start education at that level yes we need to even look at it in the healthcare setup and uh, i think most hospitals are now coming into that frame where we have such uh, practices dinned into the healthcare personnel at all levels even the hand washing techniques the way you look at uh, how the entire environment is kept clean and sterile that is what is happening it should happen to a greater extent so that we even get things better right so at this point i you're saying in bombay it is it's quite hard because the 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 volume of people that have been diagnosed with covid and with uh, severity of disease and so therefore um it is kind of um inconceivable in the present moment to kind of think about it but it it's something worth thinking about and this is where i want to kind of go back to something um professor abraham said earlier on which is this whole thing about understanding exposures within the healthcare worker workforce itself 
um, because these are high risk places. Nurses, transplant technicians, doctors themselves, everybody around will be at higher risk of having been exposed at some point in time or the other. And so if we have to continue with work as uh, without, without putting anything on hold, then there needs to be a constant vigilance on the status of exposure of healthcare workers. And so this is where you'd kind of mentioned, in addition to uh, ensuring uh, good infection control practices, looking at antibody levels in healthcare workers. Is that something that we can, I, mean, I know that you are awaiting your test, but is that something that will be a feature as we go forward um, in all our settings? You are asking me? Yes, sir. I think so, because we have, in a, it's a private hospital, not for profit, uh, where I work. Every morning at 10.30, we have a COVID core committee meeting with the specialists, as well as the infectious disease and the hospital management, including various levels of people. And we look at what happened in the last 24 hours. At the same time, before we have two buildings in the hospital, before anybody enters the building, whether it is doctor, healthcare worker, or the patient, the temperature is being monitored. And at the same time, they also are given a hand sanitizer. And uh, today, until now, I would have sanitized my hands at least about 20 times because I was going to the dialysis unit. We have to touch them. And also, so doctors should be a model and healthcare workers should be a model for others to say that, you know, because I was going to the market, to the Spencer's to buy something. And uh, I was putting on my mask, you know, covering my nose because that's what is suggested. I see a lot of people with the mask below the nose. So I told them, please wear the mask. I'm a doctor. So you have to ask you have your mask covering your nose also. And another thing I do every day when I reach home is to wash my spectacles with soap and water and make sure that that is also being sanitized. So sanitization and also awareness and also educate other people, especially healthcare workers. And I would strongly stand with healthcare worker being tested by the antibody test, because this helped us even in dengue fever also, because this is a simple test and the Kerala government is the first one probably because of Shashi Tharoor MP, they bought the, the kits in Kerala. And I strongly recommend for healthcare workers to see that whether they have antibodies in their blood suggesting either a recent infection or an old infection. Right. Um Professor Agarwal, um, in, in the last intervention that you said, you said, look, hold on. Um, you, you, were, you were the conservative one who said, just wait, don't start doing things. We may see things change. Um, in the light of the conversation that has happened, um, where do you think um, we should go? I mean, clearly there's a, uh, there are a lot of people that need their interventions. And there's a bunch of questions also that then come uh, running along with that. And then there is the issue of how do we upgrade our infection control, both at the physical level and also at the personnel level. Where do you kind of see the roadmap going ahead, sir? You see, there is a transplant program in current scenario. As I told before that uh, there is a assessment whether patient is fit or not. And although screening tests are available, but as of today, if say we test today a patient who is potential recipient, and if he's found to be negative, number one, if we are doing tests through RT-PCR, which is a gold standard, very if he is in a window period, it will not be positive. And obviously, patient will not be symptomatic. If he's symptomatic, he is obviously unfit for the transplant. In right. a asymptomatic patient, RT-PCR has got its own fallacy because if patient is in a window period, even RT-PCR will also be negative. Now coming to antibody testing, because these patients are immunocompromised, they may not mount antibody response and antibody testing may not be uh, good enough or uh, his sensitivity is low for picking up infection rate. So in that right. scenario, and there are studies which... Uh, have missed patient and patient was on incubation period and they were operated for a surgery. In post-operative phase, those patients who were missed diagnosis just because of being incubation period, the mortality was much higher in those patients who were missed because of incubation period. The third angle is that the uh, healthcare worker is uh, 
protective or not, because that is also one of the issue. Now, if we test healthcare worker today, and if he is found to be uh, having, if he's exposed, then he will only then show uh, IgG antibody, which tells that healthcare worker is protective. If he doesn't show antibodies, then that that then there is no guarantee that he is protective later on also. So there right. are so many intricacies in terms of a protection of healthcare worker, witness of the recipient, and a uh, fallacies of both the type of test RT-PCR as well as antibody response. So because we are having so many uncertainty at the moment, unless things are, we still do not know what is the antibody response in these uh, recipient, how many percentage of patients it show. If you can compare with hepatitis C antibody response, a 20% to 25% patient in spite of having infection does not show antibodies to hepatitis C. So there are many gray areas at the moment and probably nobody is saying that we are going to stop transplant forever. Right. So as far as renal transplant is concerned, elective surgery with a living related transplant are just being hold up for the time being. Even in right. renal transplant, I think there is a consensus that if we are able to organize scheduled transplant with current scenario and the availability of staff and the infrastructure of a particular hospital, it is still possible that somebody, some system can go for the disease donor transplant, which is same for the liver and the heart, as Dr. Ray said, that emergency transplant is is not stopped. Even in, in All India Institute in early, in late February, we have done Cadwell transplant when the disease was not so clearly known in the uh, in, uh, in our country. So right. it's a balancing that in a chronic kidney disease, we have an alternative treatment of dialysis. That is why there is no urgency for transplant and we can hold on. Sure. So which is which then pivots me back to a question that's come from one of our viewers, which says, um, if it's chronic, how long can a person, the question is, how long can a person continue without dialysis is, is the question. And I kind of want to tag on how long can a person, if, if they are on dialysis, can they kind of, if they are on a transplant list, how long should they be waiting on? Um, and uh, may I start with uh, Dr. Ray? I mean, yes, can, they, can, they, can they delay see, their... See, most of the kidney transplant are elective surgeries. So they can wait in dialysis if they are doing well in dialysis. And, and can they increase the time? Has, pardon? There is no time well, limit. There, no, there no, is no, no time limit. Not, so not they can be done after a year, after two, after three months, or after five days. So, sure. and sure. then the patient who have chronic kidney disease, see if they have symptoms, they have uh, uh, the, the biochemical parameters are worsening, then they will be put on dialysis uh, depending on the um, on the evaluation of the nephrologist. Can individuals um, take a longer window? If they were on a th thrice a week schedule, can they on their own, for whatever reason, um, decide that they can do twice a week? Dr. Almeida, is that something that people can kind of do for themselves? No, I wouldn't advise such uh, action because you've been stabilized on a thrice a week dialysis schedule, you have an adequate urine output or not. That's another thing which gets considered. And if you are not really passing any urine, then you'll run into a problem with fluid overload, besides having a overload of impurities, especially the potassium which you were mentioning earlier. So your fluid overload and your potassium is the one which drives you to emergency dialysis. So if you are stabilized on a thrice a week dialysis schedule, do not change it. Stick to the thrice a week dialysis schedule. I know some of my patients have come back to me that, you know, we're going for dialysis three times a week. It increases the risk of getting COVID infection. My advice to them is practice all what has been told to you as far as safe distancing, hand hygiene, use of a mask, and that will keep you safe. But Reducing your dialysis from three times a week to twice a week gets you in the place where you didn't want to be, in the hospital and in the ICU. 
And the other thing is that with the ICUs being occupied by COVID patients, you may not even get a bed in the intensive care for your dialysis to be accomplished. Uh, Professor Abraham, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, some... I just wanted to, I concur with Alan, but at the same time, you know, where we run a charity, we provide them only twice a week hemodialysis. <laughs> a lot of these patients have lived for many years with the restrictions and discipline on their life. If, for example, a lot of the patients in our country in a PMJAY dialysis program are living far away from the dialysis unit. And in because of the restrictions of transportation, they may not be able to come to the dialysis unit on a thrice a week dialysis and may be able to reach only once a week or twice a week. So it is better that many of them do have their cell phones. We can talk to them about their dietary restrictions and tell them with a dietitian sitting next to you what dietary restrictions they should take so that you know they won't land in a complications like Alan said, hyperkalemia, high potassium levels or salt and water increase. So this is something, you know, which we may have to look at because if you remember, even in the literature, there is one famous nephrologist from America, Kam Kalander, who has looked at twice a week dialysis. And he said that a lot of patients across the world are living on twice a week hemodialysis. So you, you cannot be, even though I concur with Alan, I also have some restrictions and also some reasoning to say that at least twice a week, if they are not able to come for three times a week because of the restrictions imposed on them, by the by the government and at the same time talk to them and find out you know and change their dietary pattern so that they could stay alive um, I, I take I take both of your points I mean uh, dr Almeida uh, professor Abraham um, in terms of no you should not and second is take what is available and then make do with it but here's here's a question that I have for all of you each of you is a leader and then somebody who shapes opinion and is able to speak into the policy world also from your uh, respective academic and uh, professional positions. Why should people make do? This is also a question, right? Um, should people, because we have a situation around a lockdown, get into a position where the care, the, the standard of care that they were supposed to get is kind of getting rationed out? Is that justifiable? Is, is a question that um, needs to be asked and needs a reasoned response from all of us. Sure, we may not be, and on day one, we may not be able to give everything that, uh, we, uh, life may not be able to go uh, the way we were doing it before, but to continue for three weeks and then for six weeks and infinitely out there, um, at what point do we kind of strike a balance? Um, who do I start with? Uh, Dr. Valeria. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think it's important to understand that whatever be the situation, the standard of care should not and will not change. I was privileged to work in 1993 when HIV had just come into being and nobody knew what HIV would fan out as, you know. And I was posted at the HIV ward in a hospital in England and I've seen patients die in nurses' arms when nobody knew what the disease was all about. As doctors, our first, disease, our first issue is to treat to the best of our knowledge and to give the patient the best possible care that we can under the given circumstances. So I think it's, you know, we must offer our best. We must take all the best, the necessary and what we think are the best precautions and wait and learn from our experience, learn from experience around the world, gather it all up. And if we keep all sitting back waiting that somebody else is going to tell me what I have to do, and wait for experience from say, you know, the experience has to come from us. After we are people who are supposed to tell the world what we're supposed to do. You know, we can't wait for the world to tell us what to do. We should also be contributing to that experience. We don't have to follow. We also have to lead. Right. And, and that, that would be a leadership itself. Uh, Professor Agrawal, I saw your hand up. Um, no, I, uh, I want to say, number one, we should communicate very clearly that patient himself shouldn't decide that he should shift twice a week or not because just because he is not able to come that is that is definitely should not be done now coming this has to be decided by the treating doctor and as dr Elveda said there are certain parameters which needs to be considered before we decide but i will bring in to another angle to decreasing the frequency of dialysis 
to a patient who is stable, who has got a very good urine output. You see, we don't have an unlimited staff for providing dialysis. Now, you see the situation that a, a unit, a single patient is found infected, you have to quarantine whole of the staff in that unit. So we are forced to ration the staff in individual unit, in individual shifts. So say in all India Institute, we were having five technician in one shift. We have cut down to three technician in one shift and keep some technician in a back force, provided that if a infection comes and we have to quarantine for 14 days to three technician, we will not be able to provide even the twice a week dialysis. So once the number of staff, healthcare workers which are providing dialysis has to be cut down, we have taken conscious decision and decreased the number of frequency of dialysis from thrice a week to twice a week to a limited number of patients. So you see, there sure. is a different angle. You have to see the availability of a, and I will give examples. You see, you have to see your circumstances and what is available. Had this not been there, Italy will not stop that, a, and US will not stop that a person who is 70 plus, even though if we need ventilator, he says to be rationed out that above 70, we will not put ventilator. That is not the standard of care, but we are forced to do that because the limitation of available circumstances and the availability of resources. And that, that, that'll be a constant tension, I suppose. I mean, both between providing the best that we can, exhi ex exhibiting and taking the leadership that we are assigned and that we have been um, privileged to kind of be um, blessed with, at the same time also being constrained by the availability of the resources. And, and it's going to be a constant tension between us. And I want to kind of come back to that because right in your first uh, intervention, Professor Abraham, you had mentioned something that could be um, potentially a way forward. And, and I want to come back to that uh, a, a little bit later. Um, but before that, um, there's questions. In terms of diet, those that are already on um, their dialysis schedules, um, is there any dietary changes or something that they can kind of make do, particularly because of erratic availability of uh, food that's coming in? That's one part. And the other question that was also asked was, is too much fatigue related to my existing kidney problem? What is the precaution that you would ask for somebody who is over 60 and on dialysis? So there are three, three broad general questions that people are asking. Uh, may I start with Dr. Ray? Okay. Uh, uh, for uh, patients on dialysis, as I have said earlier, they have to restrict wheat, they have to restrict their salt, they have to restrict their potassium content. They all know which foods contain potassium. Otherwise, there won't be any much change, whatever dietary prescription they have been given by the nephrologist. Fluid, potassium, and for this period, for the COVID period, fluid, potassium, and uh, salt. This restriction are important. As far as the transplant recipients are concerned, they can have their normal diet only. It is preferred that the diet is cooked at home if it is possible. And the whatever they bring from the market, it has to be like vegetables, etc., have to be cleaned properly in a potable water. It should be washed. The, it is also advisable if the dialysis or transplant patient has somebody, some relative living with him, he should go out for the market marketing. It's better for the patient himself to avoid when the, it is not possible. Of course, he has to go, but taking all the care, all the precautions. Thank you. Right. So just to repeat, um, if you are post-transplant, um, ensure you could kind of continue with your uh, normal uh, dietary patterns, but make sure that you are not putting yourself into positions of exposure. You're not going out. Try and see if somebody else can help you out with your uh, uh, procurement of food uh, and then and, and, uh, the preparation of it. For those of you that are not in a transplant situation, you are on a dialysis schedule. Enable, please make sure that you are not either overloading yourself with fluid or with salt or your potassium-rich foods, 
because they may all get you into a difficult situation. And so that's that's something that comes along. About fatigue, I mean, is, is, is excessive fatigue something that um, is indicative of something that people need to be paying attention to, uh, Dr. Almeida? Yeah, well, your mic is off. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, as far as fatigue goes, okay. if, if the hemoglobin levels of the patient are not where they should be, around about 11 grams per cent. And if that is one aspect, and if on dialysis or the interdialysis weight gain is high, and we have a lot of fluid on dialysis, then they'll feel squeezed out. I compare it to clothes coming out of a, a dryer, a washer dryer, where you really squeezed out. So that's the type of feeling that they experience. So these things, they control the interdialysis weight gain. And the other thing is get your hemoglobin weight ought to be. These are the two things which should be targeted. Right. And if you have, so if, if your um, hemoglobin is, uh, just, just keep an eye on your hemoglobin um, and then make sure that you're not gaining uh, weight in between. Uh, if you're feeling fatigued, in spite of those two being in control, please make sure that you're talking to your nephrologist or to your primary care provider. Another one more question. If I have a fever or a flu-like symptom, but it does not kind of, there's no cough or something like that, um, what should I be doing? Can I continue with my existing medications? Are there modifications that need to be done? Um, Professor Abraham. Yes, I just wanted to also go back to what Alan said. Diet hygiene is a very important thing in chronic kidney disease patients. It becomes more important during the COVID times because I go to the market. I see that a lot of the fruits and vegetables are not fresh. They have been there for 24 to 48 hours. So diet hygiene should be exercised by the chronic kidney disease patients at every stage, including pre-dialysis, dialysis, and transplant. A lot of the transplant patients, you know, they get uh, diarrhea, vomiting, and other things because of the because they don't implement diet hygiene. So I want to highlight on the diet hygiene. The next thing is about fatigue. We are one of the hemodialysis centers in the country where regular exercise is offered to patients during dialysis, physical exercise. Physical exercise is a very important thing for any dialysis patient who doesn't have a compromised heart, very severe heart failure. So it is very important that these patients are given advice regarding physical exercise to a certain extent, which they can tolerate and uh, so that they would feel much better. Hemoglobin is one of the things as Alan has already alluded to. And also protein intake is very important because every year a dialysis patient loses about two to three kilograms of muscle, hemodialysis patient. So protein intake is very important. But diet hygiene, this is a single word I use. Diet hygiene is very important to prevent complications in chronic kidney disease patients. And uh, ask you, what is the last question you asked? Because so, I, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let me hold you. I'll come back to that question because you've said something very important that I want to kind of turn around to yes. the audience. Uh, uh, Professor George Abraham from um, Chennai is essentially underscoring the need that we need to uh, be very, very careful about the food that we are buying and bringing home and in its preparation okay. and in its consumption. He's using the term, term diet hygiene. Please ensure that whatever you're taking is both uh, clean, freshly prepared, and is consumed at a time that is appropriate for don't, don't kind of keep it and then br bring it back where it might give you um, uh, problems in, in, uh, in your digestion. And then that can kind of become problematic for you. So this is something that needs to be underscored. And also the question that you've kind of raised, which can, I smiled, which is the question about exercise for those that otherwise are not having any hypertensive issues in times of lockdown. And this is particularly true for um, people who are staying in large housing complexes where RWAs essentially impose a further severe lockdown on people. Nobody should walk. Nobody should come out. How do people who have the need for exercise get that exercise when 
everybody else is screaming at them photographs are being put on whatsapp groups this so and so person has gone out and it's usually the younger people that are basically saying so um the advice that's coming in and i'm paraphrasing this and i'm probably putting words into the professor's mouth here but this is what i am understanding that people with dialysis should get a moderate amount of exercise because that is therapeutic for them am i correct in having par- paraphrased that professor abram yes 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 and so therefore i would suggest to the um, organizers to us at iswl council as a public service message we should make sure that we are sending a communication out basically telling people look there are physical exercise needs for sets of people with adequate precautions maintaining social distancing they should be allowed to have their walk or exercise or whatever that makes them uh, be a little bit more fit so that they are not succumbing to something that they did not uh, they were not adequately prepared for um, am i am i correct and is there encouragement from you for such a communication right uh, yeah. thank you and, and that, that that's notes for the organizers and for all of you that are listening if you're part of an rwa if you're part of a society group please just be mindful that while all of us need to be taking precautions do not put over uh, over restrictions on those that need their physical exercise in fact their lives depend on getting that adequate amount of exercise please do not especially for diabetics those that are on dialysis or those that are hypertensives who need a little moderate amount of exercise please do so and while you're doing it for those of you that are now going to be let out of their homes if you if your rws and your families allow you just be careful this is not an excuse to get into your let's put it say mohalla groups this is not a time to get your friends together and have a, a, a chit chat session no this is about you yourself going and getting the exercise that you need and so be mindful of that too you are protecting yourself you are enabling your own uh, body to be fit and you are protecting others from getting um, a, a, into a position of risk let me kind of come back um, to the conversation on how do we provide for care two aspects right for those that need to get to a transplant because i've heard this before in an earlier conversation that putting people on chronic dialysis is suboptimal getting them to a transplant is really the way to go forward and so that's that's one part of it and second is for those that we can't move to transplants how do we ensure that we have the frequency adjusted that is not taxing or can we do something at home so those are two two aspects to it so let me let me take the first one how long can we take the burden of chronic dialysis and is there a way that we can accelerate towards or enable more people to get to their as much as possible normal life with a transplant uh, let me start with uh, dr ray well it is well known that transplant or a chronic kidney disease patient is significantly better in the terms of uh, finance in the terms of uh, long term survival in the terms of uh, quality of life so all dialysis patient there is not much of contraindication for the dialysis patient to go for transplant so all dialysis patient if they have a related donor they can come to the nephrologist for a transplant and this is better live donor transplant gives a better result and nowadays all kind of transplants are done in between blood groups if there is antibodies or some some uh, against the against the donor so all these transplants are done then as long as the transplant is not being done they should get proper dialysis it may be two times for somebody it may be three times for somebody one thing i need to say that during the present period when we have a crisis we should not change suddenly from three to two times it may result in a difficulty it may result in a uh, breathing problem and uh, maybe hyperkalemia or more potassium so this is done by the nephrologist over a period of time trying seeing the condition of the patient and seeing the social condition also but sudden change because there is a bun there is a lockdown though you you take two dialysis a week you take one dialysis a week is probably not advisable thank you uh, uh, dr gaeria um 
should standard of care be the offering of a transplant? Because if we don't, we end up with large numbers of people who are coming into the hospital settings for their dialysis needs. And if we, if we had a significant proportion of them actually moved off into transplant situations, then you wouldn't have uh, this, this repeated coming in and uh, uh, clogging the system, so to say. Um, is that a standard of care that we should be, um, let's put it this way, looking at in terms of a cost-benefit analysis to the overall system? So if you have yeah, a I have, portion, uh, yes. I totally agree that, that yes, you should go for transplant. But transplant is not something today you decide and in a week's time or two weeks time it is done. It right. do take time. So you have to go through the process of transplantation, whether you go a disease donor uh, transplantation or a live donor transplantation. So no, I'm just yes. using the example right now. This yes. is a situation which kind of is enabling us an opportunity to kind of consider at a policy level, you know what, as a matter of principle, we should all together be saying this stop gap um, chronic dialysis situation should now transition to as many as possible. Absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. If it is feasible, everybody should go for a transplantation. Right. At this time, I have, uh, can I just one see. sentence? Sure, sure, sure. Sorry, see, sorry. Doctor. See, see, probably because of the media, our administrator, the, uh, the, the uh, hospital as well as a national level administrator are too scared of uh, COVID. As a result, our regular patient care is getting impaired. See, we have, especially as nephrologists, we have patients who are chronic, who need regular kind of attention. But unfortunately, because of too much of importance to COVID, probably we are losing some patients who are not able to get proper dialysis or post-transplant, they are not able to get proper consultation. They are not getting proper medicines. There, there is a shortage of medicine because the courier services are not working. So the result in rejection. So these kind of problem one need to both at the professional level as well as the administrative level, people should look into it. Right, Professor Guleria, Dr. Guleria, sorry. So see, if you have any disease, right? Diabetes, hypertension, age to age, if you take compare transplant to dialysis, there is no doubt transplantation gives you a far better quality of life. It's cheaper. It gives you a better quantity of life and it revolutionizes your life. Having said that, I think it's important to remember that at this time, I don't think we're seeing, I, I'm saying this again, we're not seeing the sort of scenes you're seeing in the Western Hemisphere. And I don't think we'll ever reach that because we've already crossed so many days with them, you know. I think we're seeing, we have to, we, we need to look critically as to why we are not seeing an epidemic in that form. And I'm sure it's not just because of a lockdown, right? If you look around, even, even testing will not change much. You're only, you're not seeing people dying, you know? So having said that, I think it's important for us to gradually reevaluate our risks, look at everything, formulate a plan, and gradually but surely move towards helping people move towards an organ transplant. Thank you, sir. Which then kind of brings me to Professor Agarwal and to Professor Abraham. While we kind of, um, at a systemic level, at a policy level, begin the, the shift towards enabling those that are eligible to get to a transplant earlier, how do we enable people to get the care that um, they need at the home level or at frequencies that are uh, more manageable? And then both of you had ideas around that. Sanjay, you are going to answer first. Sanjay. No, I I still want uh, clarity in the question. What what your question is. So, so the question is, sir, I mean, is there a way that we can provide people with extended periods in between dialysis? So that <coughs> especially in such constrained times. Um, we have a guideline that allows for people to work. And I know that uh, Dr. Ray has uh, very clearly kind of uh, uh, signaled a warning that you should not do this on your own. It has to be in consultation with the uh, nephrologist. But is there a way, is there, is there something that we can do? And the other thing that you had started off with, Dr. Professor Abraham, was um, peritoneal analysis at home. Is that even something that's feasible um, as we go forward? Is that something that we can take from here? One is accelerate towards transplants. The other is what do we do with frequency and at home? Professor Agarwal, to start with you.
we lost him. Professor Abraham, go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, as I alluded to already, uh, home peritoneal dialysis is a safe modality at this point in time to distance patients from crowd and also from dialysis unit. So as I said, you know, the data from East as well as from West, they haven't had any of the patients infected with COVID virus. I don't know the data from China, mainland China. And because it is very difficult, I have contacted in some of the centers, they said they haven't had any of their home dialysis, peritoneal dialysis patients having had COVID. Having said that, Edwina Brown is one of the nephrologists in London. And she had 160 patients on home peritoneal dialysis. She told me that they were in the community. There were about three who got COVID, but they recovered. So there was no issue with that compared to the hemodialysis patients in United Kingdom, where the death rate was about 15% in 926 patients who contracted COVID on hemodialysis. Now, regarding the transplant, I don't think that if a recipient is ready, if a donor, living donor, related donor is available, we should go ahead with the transplant. As Sandeep Guleria said, we are the people to establish guidelines for in India. It is not the developed countries, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, United Kingdom, or Aust uh, China, uh, or um, uh, Canada, or yes. United States. You know, we are the people and we have think tank in our country, like all of you are sitting there and many more. And so we should move forward with the transplant program. But one caution, you know, because you, when they go out into the community, they go home, they should be cautioned about taking appropriate precautions so that they don't get infected in the early post-transplant period when they are highly immunosuppressed. And this uh, guideline should be given to them. Right. Um, any, any comment on that, uh, Dr. Almeida? You're on mute. Yeah. As far as uh, home hemodialysis, there are very fledgling programs of home hemodialysis available in the city of Mumbai. And, you know, if, if you know the situation in Mumbai, you don't really have uh, houses which are large area or... You're or, audible. That's fine. Uh, houses which are large area where they could be plumbed again, where you have your dialysis machine set up. You Usually these uh, providers of home hemodialysis, bring in their machines, keep it there, and then you continue with dialysis twice or thrice a week. Or three uh, I, I think there was a distinction between uh, what you're suggesting and what uh, Professor Abraham was saying. He, he was suggesting peritoneal dialysis. Yeah, uh, peritoneal dialysis, yes. uh, in the, uh, Georgie will accept it, that peritoneal dialysis means that you would have to have a catheter implanted. And that would require some certain period of time wherein you would need to train the patient. And they, it's it's a self uh, treatment, self therapy, other than something which is done an extra corporal therapy like hemodialysis. Now you need to tr uh, train both the patient or is the patient support system at home so that during the initial period they need to be careful so that we don't have any complications related to the procedure. Sure. So do we have the time? That's about a couple of weeks, right, Georgie, where, wherein we would be required to have the catheter in and then start the training. So there is the time lag. So now, as far as your question, which you've been coming to again and again, can we reduce the amount of dialysis from three to two? It comes with a price. And unfortunately, in a certain subset of patients whom we do hemodialysis, these patients are... Uh, it's a water guzzlers. They come in with weight gains of three to five kilos in between two dialysis. They have swollen and they, they sometimes call in to say, can we have the long nocturnal dialysis where we'll be on dialysis for six to eight hours. We are about five kilos to seven kilos overweight. So these are patients who are not fit for a reduction of dialysis from three to two. There may be a small set. I do agree. In fact, I put my hand up before I got uh, lost or the internet got cut off. Uh, what Joy said is absolutely right. There are patients who do well on twice a week dialysis. And international authorities too have agreed that even twice a week dialysis is good. Now, the, pro the issue is only that subset of patients 
who are just drink and drink and don't stop. And the patients who gain a lot of weight, especially if they've got a compromised cardiac function, they will be putting themselves at risk. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm mindful of the time. We are almost at um, 87 minutes right now into this conversation. And we, we had said that we'd kind of finish uh, in 90. Um, what are the takeaways that we have for our audience um, who has joined us and who've been listening to our experts from uh, Delhi, from Mumbai, from Chennai, and from Kolkata? Um, essentially this, that people who are already diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, who are on dialysis, you are at an elevated level of risk. And so therefore, you need to, in addition to the normal um, risk avoidance uh, practices that people are doing, which is to not engage into too much of uh, community activities, you're going to stay behind closed doors, wash your hands frequently, and wear a mask um, whenever you're stepping out of your home. These are definitely there. In addition, there is the pointer from our expert panel, which says, ensure your diet hygiene. Make sure that what you're eating does not put you into trouble. Especially during these times when your access to hospital is going to be a little bit more constrained, please keep an eye on what you're drinking, how much of sodium you're taking on, how much of potassium-rich foods you're doing, uh, taking in, because that will push you into a position where you may need an extra visit to the hospital, which uh, puts you at ex additional risk. And so therefore, all that you can do at home, please do, both in terms of um, avoiding an infection and also exacerbating your um, renal uh, disease condition. For those of you that have got diabetes or hypertension, please make sure that you are taking your medicines appropriately. Do not over medicate or change medications at your own discretion. That may be harmful. Something that came out very clearly and that which we at ICW will try and get a creative out and see whether we can get into the WhatsApp groups is this, that particularly those who need the exercise should be allowed to get their exercise. And that is something that is as life-saving for them as staying behind closed doors. And so particularly residents groups and others, just be mindful that your restrictions sometimes may be problematic for others' well-being. And the last thing is, how do we look at this as an opportunity where we change the way we operate in our healthcare institutions from universal precautions for infection control does it also include our healthcare workers, provisioning them with tests that allow for us to know whether they are going to pose risk or they themselves need some care for themselves, to accelerating processes in such a way that people are not in chronic care receiving settings, that they are actually getting to the standard of care, which may be a transplant if it's appropriate for them, that they do not ha have to hang around. Uh, last closing word, because uh, so, I see your finger. I have up. one more yes. to add, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. See, there are so many people who have come with claims, fake doctors saying that you take this, you take that, and your kidney will be protected. Yeah. This is highly prevalent in the community, especially at the village level to the illiterate people. So we should strongly discourage this so that they don't land up in trouble. And they say that this is immune boosting, that is that will protect your kidney, save your kidney, reverse your kidney failure. So a strong message should go that nothing has been shown to treat coronavirus so far, COVID-19. And don't take advice from fake people so that you will put your health in jeopardy. Take advice from your nephrologist, from your primary care physician, from your hospital, from your dietary, diet, diet, diet consultant, from those that have taken care of you and have brought you so far. Do not trust WhatsApp or messages. They may be sent with good intent, but they are not qualified advice and they are not probably tailored to your situation. I want to thank each one of you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Ray. Uh, Dr. Galeria, Dr. Abraham, Dr. Almeida, Dr. Agarwal dropped off. I'm not sure um, when the connection got cut off. And all of you who have joined us on Facebook, um, we've got a couple of thousand people who were there online with us. Thank you for asking your questions. Um, 
keep your questions coming at this facebook line we will probably be able to kind of come back to you with clarifications if uh, if they are required but i want to thank all of you you are the leaders you from you what i've heard is this that while this may be a particular situation work and life has to continue at the same levels of excellence that we have been committing to and that we are committed to and that we need to kind of continue with thank you so much for being with us you have a good day and have a good uh, rest of the week thank you